stated, I am a general neurosurgeon, so I did not subspecialize. Um, I do um, just about all of those things to some degree, not to the extent that somebody who would uh, be a subspecialist and do it all the time, and that's all they do. But as a general neurosurgeon in prior practice, um, I see a lot of uh, spine disorders. I always say that uh, brain tumors are uncommon, but back pain is very common. So a lot of my patients come to me, they're older, they have degenerated spine, they require treatment and oftentimes um, surgical treatment of their spine degeneration. So I guess if you say I, I am a subspecialist, ultimately just by uh, default, because that's what I see mostly, I, I, I would consider myself an expert in spine surgery. I am a private practice uh, neurosurgeon. Most of my work is clinical. I see patients, I treat them, take care of them. But there's clinical data that needs to be gathered, analyzed. Um, so I'm involved in that kind of work uh, for the most part, if I do any at all. And so it's not a very big part of my life, big part of my practice. But I do, I am currently participating in evaluation of uh, some products and uh, gathering um, a registry data set of patients and their outcomes to analyze and to understand how these particular implants affect our patients. So that's about the extent of my research. It's, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. I mean, I'm going to pedal forward and I'm going to pull on the brake. You don't think about that because you just get on the bike and you know what you're doing. So after a while, I'm the same way. I certainly sort of, it's routine. It's the same thing over and over again. Um, so I don't necessarily think about it and prepare that way. Although I like to see the films, think about exactly what I need to accomplish because there are differences from patient to patient. Um, so it really is as, as, as sort of cliche and it kind of it doesn't have much emotion when I say this, it really is just a job. It's just, I just got to get it done, right? Um, mm -hmm. So think of it that way in the sense that, it, again, I don't, I don't think of life and death and grace and that. I mean, I'm going to go in there and one little nick and the patient dies, I got to be careful. That's not how it goes. In my line of work is neurosurgery, um, robotic surgery is a, is a big and up and coming um, part of our uh, surgical sort of theater armamentarium or regimen that we have. Um, we, we actually are currently actively using, um, we call it neuro navigation. So using technology with um, computer power and with imaging studies and so on, we can actually determine in the OR where a particular screw needs to go so we can accurately and, and, um, and as close to perfect we can make the placement of these screws. Um, but then we're also designing not using our own hands or our own, on, on our own arms and hands to, to direct where things go. We actually have some companies that are actively um, making and it's available now already, but perfecting ways for a robotic arm to actually be helping us place this instrumentation. So that's happening. We are, you know, trying to collect big giant data sets from our patients so we can predict you will have a good outcome. You won't have a good outcome. You need this surgery. You... So that's going on. Using artificial intelligence to help us do that. All of those things are taking place. Um, so there's no doubt there's constant advancement of medicine that, that has taken place. And then surgery itself, you know, we're learning to do things where we do it through small incisions. We do it through a very more, much more precise approach using all both you know computer robotic technology as well as information that we gather from our own experiences and the collective experience of, of all physicians and so on we're all going in that direction where the surgical treatments are less and less invasive more and more respectful to the patient's anatomy and more and more precise so that's it is happening even in my line of work It wasn't so much neuroscience per se. I wasn't a neuroscience major. I was actually an English major. I uh, I didn't um, sort of think about neurosurgery per se until very late in medical school. And I always tell people that it happened sort of by accident because I, I met um, somebody that was uh, a resident at that time in training in neurosurgery. And he was just a superb person. He just really impressed me, really turned me on. Just 
everything he did just was exciting and he did it really well. He was very skilled, very smart. And I was like, I want to be like that person. So I don't know what, I don't care where you go. I'm going to follow you. And, and I did. He went to, um, he graduated, went to Arkansas. I, I got into the Arkansas graduate school and I did brain tumor research for him, with him. And then he helped me get into a neurosurgery program. And um, so it was mentorship. And uh, so I think having a mentor is really very valuable. You can't do this alone. Um, people think they, they can or they want to, but it's very difficult. But it was uh, just meeting somebody who turned out to be a great mentor that sort of got me into the uh, into neurosurgery. Again, this sort of sort of fell into my lap. It was sort of an accident. Um, I, I belong to an organization where we have um, Korean American spine surgeons. Uh, I'm Korean American. So um, on one of the meetings many years ago, it's now probably it could be as maybe 15 years ago, one of the Korean American spine surgeons presented um, a talk about his trips to North Korea. And he invited all of us, any of us to go. And I was like, that's so cool. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go with you. And, and uh, he said, okay. Then um, I think the next time he went, uh, I told him I'm coming. And he told me honestly when I showed up at um, the Seoul airport, he's like, I don't. He didn't think I was going to show up, but I did, and we went, and uh, it was just really fascinating. Because North Korea is a very, it is truly an isolated country. So yes, it's like a fishbowl. So if you can imagine, George Orwell's was it 1984? It's it's very much Orwellian. It's, and so it was a very fascinating trip. Um, and then we just decided to go back again and again, and I, I probably made dozen or more trips there we haven't been able to go for the past i think not close to three years this might be the third year because of the covid crisis it's just shut down we don't have any communication with that country um but we just kept going back and kept working at it kept telling them we're going to come back we're going to bring you stuff help me help us get in the hospital and little by little they would accept us they would allow us to go into the or then they allow us to do surgery and then by the end of the time before we said stop going there were people waiting for us to come to the country to do their surgery. So it was very interesting and fascinating. But I also go to Peru. We're starting to go to Uzbekistan. So I make these trips. I try to do it every year. During my Red Sea training, um, you know, one year I was like, I want to be a pediatric neurosurgeon. And I'm going to do academia. And then Next year is like, oh, I'm gonna go out and make lots of money and be very, very wealthy. And so it goes back and forth. Um, and there's no doubt that, yes, in academia, the money is, um, uh, the salaries um, uh, are decent, are pretty reasonably good, but um, it, um, the private practice world, um, uh, you can do a lot better financially. So that certainly is an appeal that attracts people to go into the private practice world. <clears throat> and to be honest with you, uh, because academic positions are far fewer than private practice positions. The vast majority of us go into just either private practice or go work for a hospital or go work for a group or whatever it might be. <clears throat> so at the end of the day, I, I kind of just decided that, you know, I need to go out. I need to take care of my family. I need to pay taxes, whatever it may be. So um, and I I'm also the mindset that I'm very um, independent, entrepreneurial. I just couldn't see myself being academics because um, as as uh, as good as academia might be, and there's certain things that are very uh, uh, good about being in academics, um, all the patients come to you. You don't have to go out and try to make a living. The, the, the whole setup is there, but it is a, a system in which um, there is a hierarchy. Uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy. So those things can be very difficult and very, it wears you down. So. Um, having seen that in my professors, the, the guys who trained me, um, that certainly was one of the things that swayed me away from being in academia. Um, but again, I went back and forth and finally decided to just strike it out on my own and have been in private practice solely since I graduated from training. I find academic research coming out of academic institutions to be so controlled that it then when I try to apply that to my own private practice, it just falls apart. It just doesn't work in my private practice. That yes, maybe if you have a more of a research that's done with a general population rather than those who have access to a you know university, then it'll be more 
researched and results that are more reflective of truly what truly happens in the general population. But then obviously money often unfortunately influences the outcome of research projects. So that in itself is a problem. We actually already have that. It's not that, we, that academia research is pure and there's absolutely no tainting by money, but it, it could certainly get worse for sure. This, I guess I'm lucky in the sense that, um, uh, you know, this is a, a country with all its problems. And you and I know that there's so many problems in our country, but having been on these other parts of the world, been into South America, I've been to Africa, I've gone to Asia, that I am fortunate to have gone to medical school. Um, and then I'm fortunate to have sort of stumbled into a field that, um, that garners as much respect, both clinically as well as financially. I mean, I, I take care of my family, we do very well. So I'm, in that sense, I'm very, very privileged. Um, so I'm grateful. I, I get up every morning, I guess I go to work, I work hard, but I realize that if I do work hard at that um, in this country where um, many things are meritorious, that if you work hard at it, you apply yourself, that you're rewarded. So uh, in that sense, I, I was brought up that way. I continue to live that way. And um, that's sort of how it changed me in the sense that uh, neuroscience has given me that kind of opportunity.